Uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, is review today. So Terry started the day today reviewing yesterday. So I'm going to review today. It, it, it ought to be really pretty, cl pretty, pretty fresh in your minds. But if I say something completely stupid, let me know so that we can, get, we can capture uh, the events of the day uh, this way. So Paul started with uh, a discussion of uh, barriers to getting tests implemented. Uh, I thought one of the things I took away from his talk was that, that there is a link between what he is trying to do in the implementation space and, uh, and the basic science that underpins that. Uh, one of the lessons that he taught us was that uh, it is possible increasingly to work with industry, and we heard other examples of that in the discussion, and that uh, guidelines, which we've spent a lot of time talking about and how important they are in terms of moving things to practice, tend to really lag. Um, the, 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 I thought the big focus was on bench versus clinician tensions, uh, that, that this sort of, you know, almost he said, she said kind of thing. The, the, the clinicians want the basic scientists to sort of focus on what they think is important. The basic scientists think the clinicians are all doofuses. And, uh, and obviously some, somewhere uh, in the middle there's this, there's a sense that the word personalized medicine may be really offensive to people who are in practice. Sorry, doofy. <laughs> You know, seven years of Latin and I still didn't get it right. <laughs> I mean, I sort of, what can I say? Um, uh, already practiced, so there, there's this notion. It's and, and a male noun. <laughs> what? Oh. Well, it, it, could be, it could be the fourth, it could be the fourth declension and then it could be female or male, but then the plural I think is duferi. Dufus, duferi. I, somebody help me, I can't remember. Um, uh, Dufus dufera. Opus opera. Dan, you're on tape. Okay, I know. <laughs> and I'm just, I know I thought of that about 30 seconds ago. So, so uh, this idea that, that, that we, you know, that, that, that practitioners who, you know, fight the fight every day and see one patient every 10 minutes are practicing personalized medicine and take offense at the idea that they're being told that, that you know, here's how to practice personalized medicine. So we, we probably ought to think about the semantics of this a little bit. Uh, I like, I had to type, put down the, uh, uh, the quote from, from Pearl, soccer is the game of the future and always will be. So the suggestions, uh, how do people decide what to do, need assessments from clinicians, I don't know what this word, these words actually mean for the, for the system. Uh, need to assess patient expectations. Need to encourage translation and interactions between the basic and the clinical scientists very early on. Uh, maximizing opportunities to make sure sort of genomic data are included in large trials, for example. Um, then David Ledbetter uh, made the point, and I think it was made by a number of people afterwards, but I think he was the first one to make it this morning. Was that that there is an opportunity to train a cadre of PhDs to be clinician scientists, and uh, and that would include uh, informaticians and mathematicians uh, and and basic scientists of of, of many stripes. So uh, there's this idea that we're uh, manpower limited or person power limited uh, in this space, and that uh, there are a number of there there are lots of PhDs who are underemployed. So there may be a way to uh, to to uh, to make those two communities meet, um, Howard uh, uh, and his, the personal the pharmacogenomics um, summary. So I'm summarizing the summary of the summary. I think uh, so. The one question was: Do sequencing platforms add value to pharmacogenetics? And there's uh, some issues around technical aspects of variant calling, and then and then how to get to genotype phenotype relations, particularly for the rarer variants. So you have CYP2C19 star 87. What does that mean? Uh, Mark retains idea of a meta meta analysis, which is the wrong term, but the idea of looking at meta analyses and deciding what the metrics ought to be for for performing meta analyses in pharmacogenetics. So, so do you include things like dose and indication and and the kinds of things that have raised controversy around some of these analyses of pharmacogenetics outcomes and and which have been subject to criticism uh, by the pharmacogenetics community. Uh, there is a need to compare uh, to compare platforms. Um, and then there's this issue of sort of who is the advocate for pharmacogenomics implementation in the comparison to the, uh, the imaging community uh, where the imaging has been uh, uh, very, very rapidly adopted and whether that's driven by radiologists or by manufacturers and who are the sort of corresponding uh, advocates in the pharmacogenetics community uh, was something that we talked about. 
And then uh, I think re a really important point, that's why there are these little two asterisks, is, is what are the right endpoints? We've, we, we focus on, you know, predicting the right dose of warfarin or predicting intracerebral hemorrhage with clopidogrel, but maybe there are other out, out endpoints that are more, more interest to payers, like uh, uh, do patients come to work more? Do they stay on their statin? Do they have fewer heart attacks? Do they uh, get out of hospitals sooner? Uh, do they use less ICU beds? Uh, those kinds of things. And, uh, and then uh, uh, we were told to, uh, to make sure that we pay attention to uh, developing those evidences, those, the evidence for those outcomes, whatever those outcomes are. But uh, it's important to think about different, different kinds of outcomes. I, I put this back in again, Rex's, Rex's barriers, so, so, and I'm not going to read them again because I just wrote them down from a slide that you all saw within the last 45 minutes, but I did add the idea that, the, that biology is important. I, I mean, I, I actually believe that. I put that on. Paul Ritker made that point, uh, you know, cholesterol crystals as the driver of the, of the inflammatory process. I think that, that uh, you, you can't help but do better if you understand the underlying biology. Um, so. The three updates from this morning. Uh, Howard uh, obviously had a big and raucous meeting, uh, and I hope I captured some of this. Uh, the sequencing group looked at uh, return of reports and focus on qualities. There, there was this idea that you should build uh, a standard set uh, and, uh, and, and use that as a, as a metric for, for how different laboratories perform and perhaps set up standards for that. There may be different metrics for, for, for reporting variants in so-called clinical genes, the 3,000 clinical genes compared to the 17,000 uh, uh, genes of less significance. Um, best practices are needed. CAP and CLIA, it says here, will do this, are doing this. Um, but some of the best practices should include that coverage is annotated and demonstrated for target regions, uh, that there are uniform QC metrics. Um, that's just sample, the standard sample sets need to be generated. There need to be metrics for comparing platforms. There need to be metrics for developing and comparing data analysis and other kinds of tools. Uh, there need to be metrics for deciding which platform is best, not for a whole genome, or for a, but, but for, for which particular region. It may be that there are certain approaches that are better for certain regions of the genome than others, at least for the time being. Um, and the, the long-term target, and I'm not sure where long-term is, is to, is to figure out a way of getting, of, of getting to the point where you don't need to do a validation step with next-generation sequencing. For the time being, that's going to be an individual institutional decision, uh, uh, and it's not going to be mandated centrally. And then uh, who, who curates and, and how those data are displayed in the EMR is a, is a point that, that Mary raised, that, that we're not even at the point where uh, if somebody has an HLA variant, the, the name of the gene may not even be displayed in the genetic report, and we probably need some uniformity around that. Um, the family history, um, uh, EMR integration isn't yet standardized, and uh, there are a number of approaches that people are thinking about in terms of standardizing and expanding the EMR integration of family history uh, uh, information, and these are the things that I captured during Jeff's discussion. Um, then this idea of using Facebook or something, the next Facebook, uh, to uh, to capture uh, to use to to capture more family history in a in a better way, and then then the idea of developing a, a, a demonstration project to develop and validate tools to inform any system on how to acquire and display family history in the electronic record. You would implement that at, at sites that don't do it now and evaluate performance, and the performance metrics might be that are the data valid or the data used, uh, are there changes in behavior, uh, and, uh, and some of the other issues were to create a, a Spanish language version. In, in Nashville, we would want a Kurdish language version as well. And um, no, it's a, so, so when there are elections in Iraq, there are four sites where people can vote in the United States, and one of them is Nashville, Tennessee, um, because there's a Kurdish population. So there are other populations besides Spanish populations. And then, and then the idea of creating guest accounts so that people could look at uh, Mitri and the, and the Intermountain site to, to get a sense of what the tools look like. The, uh, and, then, and then I really like the idea of sort of developing this kind of uh, approach to a demonstration project, approach to evaluating what was going to happen, and then, and then substituting the word pharmacogenetics or substituting the word sequence data for the word family history. 
and then developing approaches to validating those kinds of uh, tools as well. Um, and then uh, the microbiome, uh, Murray uh, is encouraged, has been encouraged to, to extend the studies of the relationship of the microbiome to, and, and human phenotypes to other phenotypes like inflammatory phenotypes and there's a cancer phenotype as well. And then, and then he continues to look for centers that are interested in this. So those are the, that's the update from this, oh, and then, and then, and then we had an education discussion, a spirited education discussion just now. So uh, the points that I took away from this were that uh, subspecialties march through this area at different paces. Infectious disease is way ahead. The HIV guys are way, way ahead in the infectious disease space. Uh, the professional associations uh, are the in into practitioners because so they are the ones who tell practitioners what kind of education they need to uh, be getting. They're the ones who drive recertification. They're the ones who drive guidelines. Uh, they don't want to get into this space too early. They don't want to get into this space too late. There's a lot of genuine interest in the, uh, in, in the field, but there's apprehension as well. Uh, Jean talked about the New England Journal of Medicine series. I, I personally think that those sort of come, they, they get ripped out, they get looked at maybe or not, they go into a stack somewhere, but I don't think that's a durable uh, approach. There's this NHGRI TV, which, uh, that, that wasn't what it, genome.gov genome, genome TV. Genome .gov TV. I, I, I actually, uh, so there's, there's, there's some things on there that I've actually, sorry? But there, there's some things on there that are, that are, that are, um, they're fun to look at. So it, it's a site that actually, uh, if you have uh, a free five or ten minutes, you should look at because there are some interesting things on there. Uh, I thought I found these statistics sort of pretty interesting. That there's 850,000 licensed MDs, 625,000 of whom do patient care. So all the MDs who are in this room are obviously part of the 225,000 who are not full-time patient care, and then about a third of those are in primary care. Uh, there's this real sense that pharmacogenetics is going to be the first place where genomics enters the, the clinical workflow, but there are other examples as well. And then Gene was a big fan of, and, and I must say I, I, I resonate with that as well, the idea of using cases to, uh, as educational tools. Those are, th that's really fun. Um, other issues that were raised in the discussion, uh, so there, there's a lot of interest in partnerships in education, uh, partnerships with professional societies, partnerships with um, uh, even payers. Um, uh, the idea of uh, once MDs have had genetic testing on themselves for whatever, for MEN2 or for 23andMe or for whatever, they, they tend to be more uh, interested in using that for their patients. Uh, so the drivers of MD interest really are CME recertification. And then when their patients come to them and say, what do you think of this, and they have to figure out what to do with it. The idea of short courses on the web. And then there is this downside, though, uh, I, I was, I'm going to go through an exercise one day and I'm going to figure out how many times in a course of a week do I enter my Vanderbilt password to get to a site to do something that will only take me two minutes to do. Um, so there's this idea of web alert fatigue. And then, and then uh, I, thought, I thought I heard the beginnings of an action item of sort of see how this is, uh, I can't remember what this even says and it was all written within the last 15 minutes. Um, so if anybody can figure out what I meant, I'm not sure. <laughs> But it's see how see so so see how it's done at at, at uh, across uh, I think across uh, these kinds of short courses sites. Josh uh, advocated using informatics approaches. Pearl pointed out that there are these there's this idea of as an educational spectrum and that there are educational requirements that are different at different stages. The idea of genetic testing on yourself as an educational experience was raised by a number of people, and then. Uh, and then the idea of training cardiologists or infectious disease specialists or oncologists who have a specific sub-subspecialty in genetics related to their particular subspecialty is another way of in increasing the physician pool and interest, and, and, and I think that that's an important thing to do, and I'm not sure how to push that forward. Um, and, but one of the things that physicians have to do as they do that is to learn about uncertainty. Uh, and then uh, I put down here that one idea would be to a T32 mechanism to provide support for those training programs. If the institute wants to hear suggestions, there's a suggestion. So that was the summary of the morning. I hope I captured that. And uh, are there other, are there other things that I should? So, so um, Terry, should I just go on? Yeah, and then people are saying, remember your standard between 
Right, no, I'm actually looking at lunch over there. <laughs> but I, you know, I had so much stuff at the snack, I'm not sure I need lunch right now. Okay, so um, uh, I, I'm going to give you three slides on, on ideas for, uh, for, uh, for genomic medicine four. So this is genomic medicine, genome medicine three. So genome medicine four, um, uh, 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 the planning group met last night. Uh, in the back of the gaslit bar, and it's just, it was a real sort of experience for many reasons. Um, uh, so one of the action items was that, that we, all needed to, we all needed to have showers this morning just to wash the garlic off ourselves, because it was a, it was a there, we were right next to the kitchen. So, what, and we didn't have anything to eat, but it was just permeated. So, so um, it was pretty clear that there was a, the session that really caught people's imagination and attention was the session with the payers uh, yesterday. And that, that uh, I think we, we came away from, at least I came away from that, I think many people came away from that with the idea that uh, the payers are really interested in figuring out how to do this. Um, and so, uh, and we were challenged by the payers to create uh, partnerships and to go ahead and look at outcomes in a very, very broad way. And the way that Howard had, had suggested, look at outcomes like, you know, ICU bed use or whether people stay on statins for a year, the kinds of outcomes that we hadn't thought about. The, the thing that resonated with me was, the, was, was Reed Tuxen's statement that he's perfectly willing to pay uh, for a very, very expensive leukemia drug if it keeps people out of the emergency room and keeps people out of the hospital. So I think that that's the kind of challenge that we have to sort of come up with. And how do we frame uh, you know, the design of a study like that uh, is, is sort of the thing that I think we're being challenged to do. Uh, we, we thought about how, what the next step might be, and, and this part of the presentation is, is meant to be a provo prov provoking discussion and not just me standing here, but one idea was to work with uh, the Center for Medical Technology Policy, Sean Tunis's organization, as Reed Tuxen suggested. Another was for NHR, NHGRI to to take the lead in convening a, a small working group to figure out what the next step would be. Um, so thinking about how to do this rather than sort of whining about why the payers aren't paying for it. Uh, one question that we had that we sort of left open was that we weren't sure that other NIH uh, institutes and centers had, uh, had done this yet. So, and there are many partners that you could imagine, uh, HRQ, the foundation. Uh, the Patient Center Research Institute, and, and then we need to engage healthcare economic, economists at a number of different uh, levels to, uh, to do this. So, so those are the kinds of things that we sort of thought about as the, as the, as the theme around which this, this, the next meeting might coalesce. Um, so one discussion that was very practical was um, th there seems to be momentum in this initiative, so we, sh we could try to plan the next meeting for September, or uh, September seems like it's really, really close. I mean, it's it's really sort of four months away, and and uh, no, Melissa, I don't know whose problem it is, but it's not yours and mine. <laughs> so, so, but planning is a uh, is is really pretty intensive exercise. So there's this idea that we might plan later, and the focus would be on standards, standards, um, documenting. Uh, th that would be, and we would also include in the in the meeting a, a, a focus on these on the standards for sequencing reporting document in the EOM or that might be just a subgroup, but the big focus would be on this uh, this this outcomes effort. Um, so uh, the broadest at the broadest stage, um, continuing to engage stakeholders. So that was the theme for this meeting, and we certainly got uh, engagement by a number of stakeholder groups. But there are a number of groups that we manage not to have at the table here and that we would like to, con to engage uh, as well, I think. So professional organizations, um, uh, there are lots and lots of them listed here. So we need to hear from professional organizations, obviously not all of these, but some of them, the relevance of genomics to their field, the levels of evidence that they find convincing, how they make decisions on guidelines, uh, what their professional education initiatives are. We need to engage uh, the, the uh, patient care oriented research uh, initiative and AHRQ. We need to engage patient groups like patients like me or the Genetic Alliance. We, th we need to continue to work, I think, with EMRs. And then uh, I, I think we've, uh, we've had engagement from the FDA at this meeting, and I think that's been very, very useful. 
uh, both in, ter in terms of sort of making sure that we understand what it is that the FDA regulates and doesn't regulate and how we can work with them to, to move the field. And then the big debate was where to have the meeting. If we engage lots of professional societies, many of them have their headquarters in the Washington area, so that's an argument to do it in Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, the, other, the argument to do it in Seattle is that we've been in the middle of the country, we've been on the East Coast, so we should uh, do it on the West Coast so people don't have to wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning their time to come to the meeting. And then Dallas was uh, floated as an idea because at least one of the professional organizations, the American Heart Association, is in Dallas. It's in the middle of the country. It's not Chicago. And uh, doing Chicago in December is risky. So we thought Dallas in December might be a little less risky. And there is an airport hotel in Dallas, okay? So, so uh, <laughs> that will make Mary happy. Actually, there are two, the, the, the high-end one and the really high-end one. And we just, I think it would just depend. The worse than me if you know what yeah. they are by the Hyatt, the Hyatt Grand. <laughs> the Grand Hyatt and the Grand Hyatt. Come on, What's Mary. Those are, <laughs> those of us, <laughs> those of us, Luigi. those of us, <laughs> Those, those of us who, who, who uh, fly bankrupt American Airlines, like Howard obviously continues to do, uh, know that. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's where we are. Uh, comments on, the, on, the, on, on this particular slide. I think this is the, uh, the key to, to so thinking about the next steps uh, in, this, in this initiative. No comments. So we have... Uh, Kate. Yeah, so one uh, organization you don't have listed is ASCO, and this is basically uh, the number one priority of the ASCO board this year. Um, and certainly a very, very large professional organization for whom they realize they really need to be educating their uh, patient population. So uh, I, would, I would put that as a, an organization that you really need to um, engage in this. Um, I must, group. I must say, I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure how these, he, how these, how these names got on here, because um, I don't recognize some of them. I, I, I think this is sort of a, I mean, I, AHA I recognize, ACC I recognize, ACMG I recognize. I'm not sure what AAFP, the family practitioners, AAP, Patty, Pediatrics. Okay, so I, I, every, somebody recognizes each one of these. So ASCO I put at the beginning, because I, and, and there must be an infectious disease society. We just don't, what? IDSA. So I'm going to put them down as well, right? I mean, it's sort of. And, and neurology. What about the neurology. So I think we, we did just hear this, the suggestion, what about pharmacists and, and other groups? I think, you know, we're, we're talking about a day and a half meeting, and, and we probably want to focus maybe one on, on physicians, forgive us, and, and then another one on non-physicians, because it's, it's a big space to it's, try to it's, fill. So, I mean, there's, you know, there's tremendous interest in the nursing community. Uh, the pharmacists are really, really important to this effort. I mean, w as we move towards Niche implementation, we found this covers the other health professionals. Well. Sorry? Niche peg covers the other health professionals. Can't hear. Well, NHGRI, is NHGRI is in active conversations okay. with the pharmacists and, and physicians assistants and other and other groups. So maybe we could focus just on the physicians this time. Okay. When you when you focus on physicians, make sure we also reach out to the DOs because they've just stressed an interest in the last few years and I've done one or two lectures for them. So yeah, and, and most of the osteopaths actually are members of the professional societies that we would be, you know, we'd be involving. Actually, so. some aren't at all. Yeah, I, and I understand. And there's a big push now for them to have to do CME inside the DO field. Mm -hmm. So we've had a push. We have a lot of DOs at Geisinger, mm -hmm. and a lot of them are dropping the general professional organizations because they need the DO CME. I so see. just keep that in mind. Oh, that's a great, that's a great point. Okay. Yes. So, what, uh, the, but the theme of continuing to engage. Uh, sort of the external community seems like a, a reasonable pathway forward and we, we it's a way of all of us to learn what's going on in the greater community because I think it's very difficult to implement unless you know what's sort of going on out there. Rex. Uh, lest any of the work groups think they're off the hook, I think the idea would oh. also be to make yeah. sure the work groups uh, did presentations. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> so, so um, right, right. I mean, that's, uh, I'm going to put that in here as well. Okay. Mike, did you have a comment? And as far as uh, location and timing, there's a... Uh, oh, sorry. As far as location and timing, the um, clinical sequencing 
consortium is meeting in Houston in the beginning of October. I don't know if putting it up against that makes sense for people. We, uh, we, had, we, we were aware of that and, and, and figuring out some way of engaging some of this room with that meeting was something that we had discussed and, and, and we leave that with Terry and Eric. And Brad, I'm sorry, and Brad. We leave up those guys. <laughs> Other comments? Dan, maybe um, in addition to the four bullets you have there for what we would expect the uh, organizations to do would be um, to highlight some case, have them highlight some case studies if they have some that uh, are relevant to this to this topic um, where they have either made significant uh, in, uh, headway in genetics and genomics guideline uh, use or otherwise. Uh, I just think so, so something you very more practical instead of some philosophical discussion or theoretical. When you, when you say case studies, you mean you mean you mean studies of how to do this, not 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 cases. So. Not 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 clinical cases, right. but a case of a particular right. genetic test and how they dealt with it and. Either rejected a or back accepted. of your CYP two C nineteen. Okay. Okay. I think that uh, John. Oh, something about pedi something about small people. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> this is about technology. Okay. And so this meeting is concentrated on sequencing and SNPs, but there's lots of uh, interesting things happening in transcriptome and epigenetics that uh, we haven't talked about at all. The, uh, it's, uh, it's obvious that just dealing with the sequence is overwhelming, much less trying to talk about the, uh, ec uh, trying to talk about expression and how to interpret that and how to teach people about that, or about the epigenetics, which is even more complicated, or what the, uh, there was one mention of the uh, mass spectroscopy and what it can do, and so, um, I, you know, I don't know what your what your space is that you operate in, but it looks like we we're concentrating on a little small corner of it right. by um, by restricting it to the just genetics. I saw Howard running out running out of the room as you did. Sorry, my initial my initial sense was that that we could sort of assign that to the sequencing working group. The sequencing working group has so much on its plate right now. That that, uh, that that seems unfair to me, and they they focus on sequencing, as you as you say. So whether there should be something in the sort of new technology, a work group around new technologies and how they impact um, genome medicine. Um, can can we ask? Are, are those technologies that really are about to be employed clinically, or are being employed clinically? Well, so there's expression. Is. If you if you want to. Um, so, so uh, Terry, I, you, I'm sure you've heard the term. If you haven't, I'll introduce it to you. Have you heard about the Snyderome? Uh, I also heard the narcissome. The narcissome. <laughs> so, so, so there are some people who think that you know the systems biology and the Snyderome is sort of like just over the horizon. Now, uh, you know, I, we, you can sort of decide whether that's. I mean, but but so there's 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 a sense that I integrating m many data sets, acquiring and integrating many right. data sets, and that may be beyond the se wor sequencing working group. I don't I don't know. I'm just right. So it sounded like the answer was yes. So so given that the answer is is yes, then maybe another working group would yeah. be apropos. Right. So who would, who would like to lead that, John? <laughs> <laughs> I thought Scott was going to volunteer. Yeah, and I mean, it's sort of, right. <laughs> Systems. So it seems like also um, <clears throat> among that list up on the second line there that there's sort of two groups. There's, you know, and, and from, from the viewpoint of developing sequencing standards, I think it would be great to have CAP or maybe the medical genetics people or the CDC, you know, because I think if we have a, if, if we're going to, go to this trouble, it would be nice if what we come up with is embraced by these people or that they would have input so we wouldn't just, you know, be, be working in different ways. At the risk of, of offending my, my, my friend from the FDA, I, I'll, put, I'll put that on the same line as the FDA, sort of um, the regulatory superstructure around uh, the implementation efforts. So that would be CAP and CLIA and, 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 and FDA and, and other r regulators. Is that, is that fair? 
and actually Deborah Leonard is, was the cap representative and I think she's interested now right. and, and intrigued so we'll, we'll definitely have her or others back is it? And, and both David and I you know work are part of ACMG I chair the um, next gen standards working group so I think there are probably some of us that that and Mike Murray that can be liaisons easily to ACMG Okay. <coughs> other comments Ned. So, so you did have presentations from public health. So I think adding CDC or public health, which I noticed was not on there. Um, well, actually, that's what Toby was doing. But but having more of that was probably would probably be. Work. Yeah, I think the concept. Uh, well, is that, so is that, he was is here, so sure I just didn't right place, see it show up on the slide. So. I just put it next to FDA. I'm not sure whether it is that a. There are that's other, perfect. There are <laughs> other public health activities, so um, local or state public health departments. <coughs> maybe the implementation arm, and that's asked though. I'm not making that up. Um, uh, Association of State uh, Health Officers, and so there are other ways to engage the public health community uh, beyond just CDC. So, so, so say, say that acronym again. Uh, a, um, a, a S uh, T H O. Yeah, asked though. How'd you like to answer the phone that way? <laughs> Hi, I'm from asked though. <laughs> it's a T though, not a P. A -T. T. Uh, health officers, yeah. Territorial health officers. So we, we, the web will, will love, the web will the let us find the find rest. You, yeah. But, but I think this group is separate from the standards, the regulatory. Right. Right. So, so you might want to have a separate. There are more up there for public health. Professional organizations. Yeah. Okay. Ask those a professional organization. Where's that? Okay. But I would I'm be sorry. cautious in moving CDC because they did. They are in charge of CLIAC which is a scientific oversight for CLIA, and a lot of people don't realize that. Congress put them at CDC, and there's a whole department that, that looks at these kind of issues is actually working closely with CAP and with FDA, and I think that's an important group to think about. I'll just, I'll just leave it that like that. He did. He did. Okay, I, I, just, I, okay. <laughs> I just, I wasn't sure where to put CDC. I guess, I guess, I guess I'm not the only person who isn't sure where to put, I'm oh, sorry, yes, that was a little. Okay. Okay. Um, we're wordsmithing, but this is good. This is good. <laughs> yes. So another organization that you w may want to add, and you had payers here, and you were discussing a lot about CLIA, is CLIA actually CLIA or CMS? Right. So I have. I don't know whether you have it on there or not. They're because on, there. on the previous slide, when you were talking about sequencing. What's, what's put there as, as a fact is that CLIA and CAP will take care of best practices. But you know, all we are talking about is what to do and how to do sequencing. So if you're putting that as a fact there, I don't think that ACMG or, CAP or, or other organizations are gonna be very happy with that. And we're not there yet. And there, CLIA has not said anything about developing best practices actually. Blame Howard. <laughs> other, other comments? Yes. So, so in NCI, you we went through a very expensive, uh, uh, I guess, learning with, with standards issues through the CAB. And it may be interesting to bring someone that was in the advisory panel of the CAB review and, and maybe can prevent us from making some of the same mistakes. Brad, is that, is that in, your s in, your, in your space? Is that a. So, sh is, should I write that down? Learn from C A big. I'm gonna have to make the print smaller on this once again, which is good. Okay. David. If you no matter how loud you talk, it won't be captured on the video. Right. Right. So I guess what are the other No I've got to. One of the other questions that I think we need to address is just whether or not we're going to inc include things like infectious disease sequencing as part of genome medicine or not. I, I, I think we either need to make a conscious decision that it is or it isn't. If it is, then we need to consider how we're going to approach the implementation of that and really how much of that wants to come from infectious disease and how much of that wants to come from, or whether we want to decide that it's just a whole other area that is not part of genome medicine. So. 
a little different than kind of the microbiome questions, really, the, the infectious disease testing um, and, and those issues? So um, th there's, there's, uh, it seems to me there's sort of two or three issues. I'll, I'll start the discussion. One, one is the business of sequencing germs. And, and whether that's sort of a whole other effort that, that would just sort of dilute what we do. But, but there are all kinds of issues around, for example, pharmacogenetics in infectious disease, uh, using markers like CD4 counts in infectious disease. One of the reasons that HIV doctors adopted Abacavir is because they're used to sort of changing the way they think because of a lab test as opposed to other people. So I, I'd hate the idea of saying, you know, we're going to do everything except infectious disease. So, so we have to figure out a way of, 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 of saying, if we're going to do that, we have to think of a way of saying it, but still embrace that community, because they're one of the big users of this kind of technologies in, in many other ways. I think what you're saying is whether you really want to include resequencing of microbes as part of this effort. And I, I, don't, I don't have a strong feeling about that. I let somebody else decide that. Pearl, yeah. did you have something to say? Well, or, or so any any other comments about the infectious disease stuff? I'm just going to write that down and and let let uh, as we sort of th think about planning how to how to you know decide have to make a conscious decision about whether to include the that in the sequencing. I think that's the uh, that's part of it. Can I just add something for for the microbes? It's not going to be all, always just resequencing. It's going to be sequencing too because you have new resistant genes and new species coming up all the time. So. I'll just leave it like that. Pearl? Um, with some trepidation, but one of the elephants in the room is direct-to-consumer genetic testing. Yeah. And I'm not sure if it goes on this slide, but you know, in terms of someone active in this space, I think we can't ignore it, but I don't know where to put it, so I just thought I'd give it to you so you could handle it. <laughs> is that, is, it's almost like patient groups, but it's not. Um, I mean, you know, the, some of those companies are doing some really pretty interesting things in terms of just sort of, you know, using questionnaires to get phenotypes now that they have a gazillion people genotyped, and they're sort of doing GWAS on scale uh, because they can. Michael? I, I, I should put that down somewhere. I'm not sure where. But. Well, it might fit into a, a bigger category of um, private genome companies, including Gnome and some others that are that are trying to impact this area in lots of different ways. Well, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I didn't say that right, but yeah, private genome efforts. Of course, you know, I don't think we're we're sitting here trying to say, well, you know, this so, is so this is a, this Andy is entirely government space, and you're not allowed to. Yeah. Part, you know, Andy has a look. comment while you're typing. Yeah. Just one comment related to that. I was at the personal genome meeting last week at Harvard, and I think, you know, all of this is focused around disease and disease prevention, and there's a whole other effort that's looking at looking for positive traits and, and other things. And, and I think when you're talking about the DTC part, you're probably going to see as much in that space as you are in the disease space, and those are a lot of the early adopters people using are using it for that reason. Um, and it might be interesting to have someone from that group come and talk about um, when when you find positive things in, in a genome that you need to share with someone. Okay. Great. We probably should wind down. It's yes. No, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here. <laughs> or have we already? I, I think this has been, you know, this is really f fun. But we, at some point we ought to stop. And I think that this is good. So before we stop, I, I need to once again thank, is Robin in the room? Robin has left the room again. Okay. So one, I need to thank Robin, who was out of the room the last time we thanked her. Uh, Lauren and Melissa for putting this meeting together. <laughs> Thanks. And we'll have lunch. And we're adjourned. See you all in Bethesda, Seattle, or Dallas in September or December. Um,